Acts chapter 15, we're looking at congregationalism part two, examined and refuted in our fourth in a series on Presbyterian church government. And uh, we're examining congregationalism of the old Puritan type and showing why it's unbiblical. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5. And you'll see why uh, I'm reading this a little bit later, because this is one of the proof texts for congregationalism. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Okay, that's called incest. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that have done so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together and with my spirit and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Jesus. And their argument is, oh, when they're gathered together, see, they had a congregational meeting and they voted whether to discipline him or not. That's the argument, which we'll look at in a little bit. Now, we're in the midst of discussing the congregational use of Acts 15 to support their position. Right now we're considering the congregational position that not just elders have authority to deal with matters of discipline and doctrine and worship, but also the whole congregation must vote on the matter. And uh, if they don't vote on the matter, the elders can't, their ruling does not stand. So we're looking at that. Now, given the broader and narrow context, of Acts 15, and we're talking about 22 and 23. The fact that the circular letter was sent from the apostles, elders, and the whole church does not mean, does not mean or even imply that all church members took part in the debate. <clears throat> the historical account, which is probably a summary of the main points of what happened, reveals that they probably did not speak. All the people speaking were either apostles or elders or ministers. And of course you have Acts 5, uh, 15, 12, which says the whole multitude kept silent. James, the brother of Jesus, however, played a prominent role. He wrote the epistle of James and was at least a teaching elder and a prophet. Galatians 1.19 strongly implies that he was an apostle, calls him an apostle. So, there's no evidence that church members took part in the debate or voted on the matter. That's all assumed from simple the fact of that they're mentioned. The apostles and elders were the church's representatives and had authority to decide such matters. So of course the church of Jerusalem would be mentioned in the letter. The elders of the flock have the authority to speak for the church as long as they do not contradict or go beyond the bounds of Scripture in matters that are not indifferent. And J.A. Alexander writes this in his commentary on, on Acts. The apostles and elders, <clears throat> not as independent bodies, nor as a body separate from the church itself, as they're represented, not by human delegation, but by divine appointment. So the elders are the church's representatives. And thus when the elders vote and make a decision, it's the church's decision. And the idea of a body of elders needing a authoritative concurrence from the congregation is also disproved by the following considerations. Number one, that the elders had a governing authority, power and authority that does not reside in all the members is proved by the setting up of such offices in the Old and New Testament themselves. Ecclesiastical ruling and teaching elders offices are distinct and separate simply because of the fact that they have been set over others by God. The elders of the New Covenant Church are described as rulers, pastors, overseers, stewards, and governors. Such terms are obviously intended to teach a special office that holds a special governing power and authority. <clears throat> that, that, that much is simple. On the local level, even congregationalists admit this. 
But if God has set apart certain men to rule, and yet these men must seek an authoritative concurrence for everything they do or decide <clears throat> from the congregation, who, by the way, obviously outnumbers the body of elders, then they are really not rulers at all, but at best spiritual cheerleaders or spiritual coaches. All their leadership, all it involves is trying to get the congregation to vote on this or to go along with that. They're not really rulers. At the most they can do is seek to lead by a, a teaching influence, but are not true, true, true church governors or overseers. So congregationalism on this point suffers from an internal contradiction. If the system of ecclesiastical rulers was a human tradition or a human invention or purely arbitrary, a pragmatic office, such a contradiction could be ignored. Humans make mistakes. But the fact that God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit set up this office, the biblical doctrine of a separate authoritative office of ecclesiastical rulers must not be greatly watered down or rendered null and void through a form of democracy, which is what congregationalism does. <clears throat> and I've been in independent churches where the elders wanted to do A, but the congregation wanted to do B, and the elders were overruled by the congregation. It happens. Upon the congregational theory, the office bearers may have over and above what other members of the church may possess. First, a power of advising the church to adopt certain measures. And second, a power of executing the measure after it has been adopted. But so long as it is asserted that their authority is limited by the condition of the members giving or withholding their consent to its acts, they cannot be said <clears throat> to have a power of authority at all in the proper sense of the word. So congregationalism is really, in the long run, destructive of the office of eldership altogether. And historically, that's exactly what's happened. <clears throat> and then number two. In Matthew 16, 19, Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom to Peter, who is the spokesman of all the apostles, and thus by extension and application, church authority for admission or exclusion is given to church officers, ministers and elders, and not every member of the local church. David Dixon says, quote, and he's an old covenanter, quote, the ministerial power of the keys is promised to the ministers of the kingdom. That is, the apostles and their successors in the pastoral charge. Such as have the office of administration of the keys have their authority in that office only from Christ, in whose name the keys are to be used, for he only is the giver of the keys. For it is said, I will give thee the keys. End of quote. Independents must argue that the keys are given to everyone in the church who confess Christ, but this view is, is untenable, and even the great John Owen rejects it. <clears throat> Out of all the congregationalists that, that I've read, I think John Owen's the best. Moreover, <clears throat> if one holds the position that authority is bestowed upon the church as a whole, Scripture indicates that Jesus has provided officers to exercise that power in specific situations. And like, I don't deny the fact that Christians have authority. We're called priests, kings in the Old and New Testament. The priesthood of believers. Church officers are called, set apart, and gifted by Christ through his spirit. While the officers of the church are representatives of the people, elected by majority vote, they do not drive their authority from the people. Okay, this is not democracy. Their authority comes directly from Christ, and to him alone they are accountable. Okay. 
Contrary to certain forms of congregationalism, various Presbyterian ministers of London point out that authority comes directly from Christ. And here's what they say. This is from Sundry Ministers of London, the Divine Right of Church Government, 1654. <clears throat> when was any such power derived from Christ to the multitude of the faithful? Either in Ecclesia Constituenda or Constituta, either in the first planting and beginning of the church or in the later establishment and growth of the church under the apostles' ministry. Not the first, for then the apostles themselves would have derived their power from the fraternity or community of the faithful. Now this is palpably inconsistent with scripture, which tells us that the apostles had both their apostleship itself and their qualifications with gifts and graces for it. Indeed, in the very designation of all their particular persons under that calling, all of them immediately from Christ himself. Galatians 1, 1, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, John 20, 23, Luke 6, 13, Matthew 10, 5 and 7. Mark 16, 15 to 16, John 20, 21, Acts 1, 24 to 26. Nor the second. For if such power is committed to the community of the faithful after the apostles had established the churches, then let those who think so show where Christ committed this power first to the apostles and afterwards to the community of the faithful, and by them or with them to their ordinary offices for execution thereof. But no such thing has any footing in scripture for the ordinary church guides though they have designation to their office by the church, in other words, the church votes upon them, yet they have their donation or derivation of their offices and its authority only from Christ. Their office is from Christ. Ephesians 4, 8 to 11, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, Acts 20, 28 to 29. Their power is from Christ. Matthew 16, 18 to 19, Matthew 28, 19 to 20, John 20, 21 to 23, 2 Corinthians 8, 10, Titus 1, 17. They are Christ's ministers, stewards, ambassadors, 1 Corinthians 4, 1, 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 20. They are to act and officiate in his name, Matthew 18, 19, 1 Corinthians 5, 4 to 5. And to Christ they must give an account, Hebrews 13, 17 to 18, Luke 12, 41 to 42. Now, if the ordinary officers have, as well as the apostles, their apostleship, their, office, their offices of pastorship, teachership, etc., from Christ, and are therein the successors of the apostles to continue to the world's end, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, then they have their power and authority in their offices immediately from Christ as the first receptacles thereof themselves and not from the church as the first receptacle of it herself. Consequently, the church and community of the faithful cannot possibly be the first receptacle of the power of church government from Christ. Now, that's a difficult quote, but I, it makes a heck of a lot of sense. And it disproves congregationalism emphatically. They are responsible to rule, that is elders, whether teaching or ruling. They are responsible to rule in accordance with the word of God, not the desires of the people. Now, I know the congregational would say, well, the people are obligated to rule according to the word of God as well. <clears throat> Number three. A reading of the New Testament gives us abundant evidence that church power and authority are uniformly ex exercised by church officers, teaching and ruling elders, and not by all the members of the church. Here's what Bannerman writes. And to me, this is just a devastating point that completely disproves congregationalism. Quote, church power in all its various departments, whether exercised about doctrine, ordinances, government, or discipline, is always administered in the New Testament church by parties in office and never by the members of the church generally. That such is the fact, the briefest reference to scripture will su suffice to demonstrate. The titles and names expressive of ecclesiastical authority in scripture are restricted to a certain class and not given indiscriminately to all the members of the Christian society. The qualifications necessary for administering church power are required not from all, but from a few only. The instructions for the true discharge of its functions are addressed to a limited order and not to the church collectively. And the examples in the word of God of the performances of the duties attached to the possession of ecclesiastical authority are always examples of these duties being discharged by men in office and never by persons without office." End of quote. 
Here's some examples. Jesus, and this is, I know people have been taught the wrong thing about the Great Commission, but the Great Commission is given to the apostles and their successors. Uh, pe people who are regular church members do not have the, the keys of the kingdom or the authority to administer the sacraments. Jesus gave the Great Commission or the duty to disciple the nations through preaching and administering the sacraments to the apostles and their successors, not to any Christian in general. If he did, then all Christians can preach and administer the sacraments. And nobody agreed. The Congregationalists don't even agree to that. Congregationalism wants to leave preaching and administering the sacraments in the hands of church officers who have been called, trained, set apart, and ordained to that service. But in the matter of matters of settling doctrinal disputes and discipline, their calling and requirements are superfluous, for everyone in the whole church has that duty. You see the, the contradiction. This inconsistency has led over time in most congregational churches either to the abandonment of the eldership for a raw democracy. This has already happened to a large extent. And we noted my lengthy quote early this morning from a congregationalist pastor in his preface to the uh, Savoy Declaration. Or the concept that elders do not have any special authority at all. And we see that in the house church movement today. Uh, Anabaptist movement, a very heretical, dangerous movement, where all the men in the church take turns ruling and preaching and teaching. There is no special office. And that's more popular than you think. It's spreading. The elders are basically cheerleaders, and the men in the church take turns at serving as elders for a temporary period of time. The congregational system explicitly contradicts Paul's instructions to Timothy and Titus regarding the duties of office bearers. When Paul gives instructions to Titus on what to do with a divisive man, who have chosen to follow false teachings and practices, he says this, Titus 3.10, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. <clears throat> the word admonition includes both instruction and warning combined. It's a very rich word in Greek. Since this epistle is addressed to Titus, one can safely assume that Titus and the elders are responsible to admonish and discipline not the whole congregation. Once a heretical person does not repent in the face of two admonitions by the church session, they are to be excommunicated from the church. Now, being cut off from the society of believers, the local congregation is a public act, and it is done before the whole congregation. We see this in 1 Corinthians 5. And we'll look at that in a moment. The apostles expressed the nature and consequences of such discipline in other places. Withdraw yourselves, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Not even to eat with such a person, 1 Corinthians 5, 11. Do not receive him into your home or greet him, 2 John 10. Note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them, Romans 16, 17. And of course, uh, Matthew 18, 18. Uh, or 19, maybe 20, regard them as a tax collector and a, and a heathen. John Owen's teaching on this matter is excellent and in general contradicts what most classical independents would say. Quote, <clears throat> oh, just a note first. The word reject, peritu, means to refuse, reject, decline, or avoid. It signifies in civil matters to be kicked out of a city as an outcast. When applied to the church, it means to cast out by excommunication. The, search, the church session excommunicates, and then the whole church must be informed and submit to the decision of the body of elders. Okay, now let's go to John Owen. Quote, This excommunication, as we have proved before, this is from his... Uh, his essay on, on church discipline excommunication. 
This excommunication as we approved before is an act of church authority exerted in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if so, listen to this. Then if so, then it is an act of the officers of the church, namely, so far as it, it is authoritative. For there is no authority in the church properly so called, but what resides in the officers of it. There is an office in the church which is merely ministerial, without any formal authority, that is, of the deacons. But there is no authority in exercise but what is in the elders and rulers of the church. And there are two reasons which prove that the power of excommunication, as to the authority, authoritative exercise of it, is in the elders of the church. Number one, because the apostles, by virtue of their office power in every church, did join in an authoritative excommunication as is plain in the case of 1 Corinthians 5. And there is no office power now remaining but what is in the elders of the church. Number two, it is an act of rule. But all rule, properly so called, is in the hands of rulers only. We may add here, hereunto that the care of the preservation of the church in its purity, of the vindication of its honor, of the edification of all its members, of the correctness and salvation of offenders, is principally incumbent on them, or committed unto them, as we have declared, as also that they are best able to judge when and for what the sentence ought to be denounced against any, which requires their best skill in the wisdom of spiritual rule. And therefore, the admission of the exercise of it when it is necessary is charged as a neglect on the angels or rulers of the churches as the due execution of it is commended in them. And therefore, unto them it doth belong with respect unto their office as is thereon an office act or an act of authority. End of quote. The true nature of a gospel church in works. Volume 16, 165 to 166. Now that... Now, I, I realize John Owens an independent, but that is inconsistent with what 99% of independents teach. It's inconsistent. <clears throat> the admonition to Timothy on his ministry of preaching, teaching, exhorting, and rebuking, obviously, obviously sets the authority of the elders apart from the whole congregation. Here's the passage, 2 Timothy 4, 2-5. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And what's amazing just a side note, what's amazing is, is these admonitions, these commands by the apostles on false teaching and warning and rebuking, we find them throughout the New Testament, and yet modern Presbyterian churches take false doctrine very lightly. Deny the Sabbath, no big problem. Deny six-day creationism, no big problem. Deny the regular principle, that's eh, no big problem. So we're arguing for consistent biblical Presbyterianism, not modern Presbyterianism. This is an instruction on the proper exercise of authority that does not apply to the congregants. Preaching is one of the most crucial ways of ruling and exercising the keys, and not even congregationalists argue that all the men should share in the writing of sermons or take turns preaching on the Sabbath. Now, modern... The so-called house church movement takes congregationalism, the error of congregationalism to its logical extent, and all the men of the church take turns preaching. Now, why don't they let women preach? Well, Paul says women can't teach or have authority over men, and women are to keep silent. But they let all the men take turns. And so you have shared ignorance in churches. You have men who are not trained getting up there. Now, the best you get out of that is somebody just repeating what Matthew Henry or Matthew Poole says. At least they're not going to get heresy that way, but it's totally unbiblical. In 1 Timothy 5, 19 to 20, Paul instructs Timothy on how to handle accusations against an elder. 
and what to do when an elder is guilty of scandalous sin. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest may also fear. This passage assumes that the issues of discipline come before the pastor and elders for analysis and judgment and not the whole congregation. Because men in position of leadership are usually subject to more scrutiny, criticism, and rumors than others, Paul wants Timothy to make sure that Deuteronomy 19.15 and Matthew 18.16, which is simply an application of Deuteronomy 19.15, are carefully followed. No accusations or charges are to be received or entertained by Timothy and by implication the body of elders unless two or three reliable witnesses are provided. Remember now, this is, goes back a long way, but my sermons on the trial of Christ, when I did a study of the, the Sanhedrin, how the Sanhedrin was supposed to work, um, <clears throat> witnesses were interviewed very carefully by the elders and if it was determined that they were not reliable people, they were not allowed to test, testify. If somebody was a known criminal or a known liar, uh, they were not allowed to testify. People had to be reputable to testify in a court. The church session is not to, to acknowledge or accept an accusation against an elder unless two or three witnesses are willing to verify an accusation. If the elders consider the accusation and the elder is found to be guilty, of persistent or continued unrepentant sin or simply present guilt, the present active participle, uh, <clears throat> tus, hamar, tanatos is used, then the elder is to be rebuked before all. So it could be, it could refer to unrepentant continuous sin or it could re simply refer to present guilt. Those are two possible interpretations. Then the elder is to be rebuked before the whole church. The guilty elder is to be rebuked by the session in the presence of the whole church in order that all may fear. Now I want you to think about this carefully. If the accusations were discussed in a congregational meeting and the whole church took part in the judicial proceedings, which is the congregational position, the announcement of a verdict before all would be completely superfluous. You see, these instructions to Timothy presuppose the Presbyterian system, that the elders decide, and then it goes to the congregation. It's made public to the congregation. The passage assumes that discipline is dealt with by the body of elders, and the verdict or sentence is then announced to the whole congregation. Now, doesn't that make sense? Now, various Presbyterian scholars from London beautifully summarize our point. And this is from that book, The Divine Right of Church, of Church Government, from 16, oh, what was it, 49, 59? Quote, <clears throat> what power is it that is committed to the body or church or multitude of the faithful? Either it must be the power of order or the power of jurisdiction. But neither of these are allowed to the multitude of the faithful by the scriptures but appointed and appropriated to select persons, not the power of order. For the whole multitude and everyone therein neither can nor ought to intermeddle with any branch, branches of that power. Number one, and this is devastating, not with preaching, all are not didactikoi, that is able to, pre, able to teach, 1 Timothy 3.2, nor legakoi, able to exhort and to convince gainsayers, Titus 1.9. All are not gifted and duly qualified. Some are expressly prohibited from speaking in the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35. 1 Timothy 2.12, Revelation 2.20. And none are able to preach unless they be sent. Romans 10.15. Nor to take honor unto themselves unless they are called, etc. Hebrews 5, 4 to 5. All are, are all, and every one of the multitude of the faithful able to teach, exhort, and convince? 
Are they all sent to preach? Are they all called of God, etc.? No. Has not Christ laid this task of authoritative preaching only upon his own officers? Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Number two. Not with the administration of sacraments, of the sacraments, this and preaching are by one and the same commission derived to officers only. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. And just a side note, the idea that that's extremely popular today among evangelicals that the Great Commission is, is giving to the every Christian. Uh, you can go online and I have a refutation of that. It's just simply nonsense. Disciple through preaching and baptizing, which are something that not everybody can do. Number three. Nor to ordain presbyters and other officers. This may choose... They may choose extraordinary officers, or the presbytery of ordinary officers may ordain. Acts 6, 3 to 6, Acts 13, 1 to 3, 14, 23, 1 Timothy 4, 14, 5, 22, Titus 3, 5. So that the people's bare election and approbation is no sufficient scripture ordination of officers. In other words, a church will select their pastor and vote. He'll get voted in. I think the RPC and A, you had to have two thirds of a vote to get in. And then once he's voted in and called, he's, he, he's got an external call, then he's ordained by the presbytery. They're two different things. Nor is there one of 10,000 among the people that are in all points able to try and judge of the sufficiency of preaching presbyters for tongues, arts, and soundness of judgment in divinity. Nor is the power of jurisdiction in public admonition, excommunication and absolution, etc., allowable to the multitude, for all and every one of the multitude of the faithful. Never had any such power derived to them from Christ. This key, as well as the key of knowledge being given to the officers of the church only, Matthew 16, 19, and 18, 18 to 20. Tell the church, there must necessarily be meant the ruling church only, as appears by consent of different judicious authors. 2 Corinthians 8, 10, John 20, 21 to, 30, uh, 21 to 23. <clears throat> when he says tell to the church, we're going to look at that passage. I don't have a problem saying that the church means church, the body. But you define who's to do what through the teaching of the scriptures, the analogy of scripture. You don't simply assume that Telling it to the church involves the people making authoritative judgments. That's an assumption. In addition, as noted above, judicial decisions are left in the hands of the body of elders, not the whole congregation. Well, what are the passages used to support congregationalism? The three chief proof texts for the congregational system of discipline are Matthew 18, 15 and following, Acts 15, and 1 Corinthians 5, 3 to 5. Acts 15, 22 to 23, we've already considered above. We've looked at that. In first, so let's look at the other two. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5, we read this. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife and you are puffed up and if not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed is absent in the body but present in the spirit have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, in order that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, the effect of excommunication, the intended effect is repentance. This section of scripture is used as a proof text for their idea that the whole church is involved in the judicial process and not simply the elders. This point is supposedly proved 
from the fact that the whole church is addressed and not simply the elders. In addition, it is argued that the sentence of excommunication was imposed by the whole church and not simply the elders. Is this what the text is actually teaching? Or are congregationalists reading too much into this passage? Well, the situation at Corinth was very serious, for the whole church was either tolerating or condoning the open practice of incest, which was not even accepted in Roman society or Greek society. Although it was practiced to a degree among royalty. That Paul would address the whole church on this matter is understandable. It, however, does not tell us that he expected the whole church to act as church governors. It merely reflects their guilt, neglect, and arrogance. No good exegete or interpreter of Scripture would argue that every instruction or rebuke in an epistle applies equally to all. No doubt the leadership at Corinth bore a special responsibility in such obvious cases of scandal as sin. What is important here as far as the debate over church authority is that the apostle does not tell them to have a church meeting to weigh the evidence and determine guilt. That's the assumption of congregationalists here. Paul himself, in his, in his capacity as apostle, had already passed judgment in verse 3. In contrast to the Corinthians, who were puffed up and did nothing, Paul takes decisive action. He has already passed judgment and is present in spirit even though he is not there physically. Listen to what he says. I have already pronounced judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Due to the crisis of authority and the antinomianism at Corinth, Paul orders the church to excommunicate this offender at the next public meeting of the whole church. That's what he does. He orders them to do it. Now, whether or not the elders voted to implement Paul's order or voted in concurrence with it as if Paul was present, the passage is silent. The passage, however, implies that they must come to the same conclusion with him, with Paul. You have to be very careful about reading things into passages that are not there. But these verses do not discuss or lay out a biblical procedure as to how guilt or innocence is determined. In this case, guilt has already been established, and the focus is on the act of excommunication. While under normal circumstances, the session or body of elders determine guilt and then announce the excommunication at a public meeting of the church, Excommunication is something that the whole church must act upon. The church was to be convened. Paul, spiritually present, not physically. The sentence was not to be passed or executed in secret, but openly. It was to have the solemnity of a judicial proceeding, and therefore the people were convened, though they were merely spectators. There's not a shred of evidence that they took part in judicial proceedings. Paul had already pronounced guilt. It was a matter of the elders saying, yeah, Paul's just told us what we need to do and we're going to do it. <coughs> it is important in a matter of discipline that the biblical reasons for the sentence are explained by the session and the congregation is led to a concurrence. Now, in this case, it should be very simple. Incest is condemned explicitly in Leviticus chapter 18. And since we're not dispensationalists and we believe in the whole Bible and we believe that all the moral laws and case laws of the Old Testament are applicable today, uh, that is very easy to prove that incest is immoral. The congregation is to be instructed to regard the person excommunicated like a heathen and a tax collector, Matthew 18, 17. But everyone is to pray for the person and seek their repentance. 
There is not a shred of evidence in this passage that the people debated the guilt or innocence of the man committing incest or that they voted to convict. It's not there at all. So congregationalists are just assuming that their position is true with no evidence. But when a person is excommunicated, the whole church expels the person, not just the body of elders. This distinction is crucial to the congregational view. Not only uh, reads procedures into the passages that are not there, but also contradicts the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the elders would meet, the elders would vote, and then the person was determined to be guilty or innocent. If he was guilty, the elders would pass sentence. But the whole people of God had to carry that sentence out. Now, obviously, death penalty, it was stoning, but it could be simply casting out of the community of the faithful. This passage tells us, and this is, the, this is the main lesson of the passage, that excommunication of the practice of church discipline must be a public event. The guilty person is to be handed over to the power of Satan before all, just as guilty elders are to be rebuked before all in 1 Timothy 5.20. Notice the similarity. The sentence is carried out before all. The fact that the sentence is carried out before all does not tell us that all had a vote in the sentence. See what they're doing? They're just reading their presupposition into the passage. Presbyterians do not believe in secret courts. Now, executive session exists in rare instances. The Presbyterians do not believe in secret courts, and they believe that church discipline must be an affair conducted before the whole church. They also believe that the whole church is responsible when open sin is tolerated and excused. But there is nothing in these verses about all the church members getting together as a court to analyze evidence and determine guilt. That was not the issue in this passage. Paul authorita authoritatively determined guilt and passed sentence in Christ's name and by his authority. So the fact that Paul has already passed sentence takes the whole underpinnings of the congregational view out and proves it's wrong. Instead of trying to read congregational presuppositions into the passage, it is much wiser to see Paul's response to such scandalous conduct in terms of the Old Testament background. Passages from God's law are the foundation of Paul's response to such wicked conduct. Incest is specifically condemned in Leviticus 18 and Deuteronomy 22 and 30 and 27 and 20. The command to purge evil from the midst of God's people is found in Deuteronomy 13, 5 or 6 in the Septuagint, 17, 7, 19, 19 to 20. 21, 21, and 24, 7. Purge the evil from your midst. Get it out of the covenant community. Appointing judges to render judgment, just decisions, when, the, uh, when disputes arise among the people or serious offenses are committed, is found in Deuteronomy 16, 18 to 30. And I haven't got to that yet, but we're going to look at the eldership in the Old Testament. The elders considered judicial cases and made their decisions, and they were passed, in, passed the sentence in public. And they were carried out in public. But the public didn't make the decision. The elders made the decision. So if you accept the congregational view, there's a radical change between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there's not. They're wrong. With this background in mind, the sentence of excommunication would be carried out by the body of elders and publicly announced publicly by them at church. The sentence could only be truly executed when, with the cooperation and concurrence of the congregation for excommunication involves removal of the unrepentant guilty party from the society of faithful Christians. 
Excommunication is essentially worthless if, if the Christians ignore, if the church members ignore what the pastor says and the, the session says. This expulsion from the society of Christians, even though the judgment of the elders, is literally a punishment inflicted by the many. And that's, that's, that's a subordinate proof text of the 1 Corinthians 5 argument, is they go to 2 Corinthians where Paul tells them, hey man, this guy's repentant, you've got to slack off on the poor guy uh, because of the infliction of the punishment by the many. The Presbyterian view is not only much more rational and practical, it does not have uh, new believers and people untrained in theology, exegesis, and logic making crucial decisions on doctrine and discipline, but also fully concurs with the Old Testament's courts, which were conducted by a plurality of elders, not, not the whole covenant community. The best passage for the congregational viewpoint is found in Matthew 18. And this is, I think, their best passage. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if, if he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more. That, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. That's Deuteronomy. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if, you, if any two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it shall be done by them, for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my, together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Congregationalists interpret, tell it to the church, as clear proof that the power of church discipline is bestowed upon the whole church as a body. And thus all the communicant members, in conjunction with the elders, must determine guilt and punishment together. I think that's their best proof text. Here's a footnote I forgot to give you. Let me just give it to you quickly and we'll jump back. Here's Bannerman. It is sufficient to remark that the sentence of excommunication already pronounced by the authority of the rulers should be practically carried out only by the aid of all the members of the church cooperating with the rulers and withdrawing from the society of the person excommunicated. There was a duty lying upon the members of the church to put away from their communion the offending uh, party upon whom the sentence had been pronounced. And this expulsion from the society of Christian people following upon the sentence of the rulers might well be called a punishment inflicted by the many. Now, they view, tell it to the church. Tell it to the church means, in their view, that you tell it to the church, that is the whole church, everybody, and then everybody gets together and decides what to do judicially. And everybody gets together and they all vote and decide what to do. That's their view. And I think it's their best proof text. This would occur at a church meeting where the whole church debate the case and then vote on the person's guilt or innocence and then vote again on the appropriate punishment. Like the case like their view of 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5, congregationalists are reading a detailed judicial procedure into a simple command to convey information about a disciplinary case to the church. They're getting a, a lot out of that tell to the church in its statement. Even if we accept the interpretation that the word church means the local congregation and not the session or body of elders, and I don't have a problem with that, it does not logically or exegetically follow that Jesus is here advocating a judicial system in which every communicant member is part of the court that declares guilt or innocence. It could mean that in a case where sin has been confronted on two occasions with multiple Christian witnesses, it is time for the matter to become public and to be dealt with appropriately. In other words, Jesus is not even advocating 
a particular system of church government here, but assumes that what is taught in other places in a clear manner will be applied. This is very simple hermeneutics. It's a simple way of exegeting scripture. You take the clear passages and the passages that are less clear or difficult to understand are interpreted in light of the clear passages. That system which is found in both the Old and New Testament is rule and judgment by elders who are called by Christ to a specific caste and are appointed and acting representatives of the local church. Since Jesus has appointed and set apart in the church governors, elders, overseers, or rulers who must have particular qualifications to rule, and the congregants are ob obligated to submit to their authority, Hebrews 13, 7 and 17, why, why should we interpret this statement, tell it to the church, as indicating all members are judges in judicial cases. You understand what I'm saying? Tell it to the church. Yeah, tell it to the church. But it's a big jump from tell it to the church to, yeah, you get together, you have a meeting, and they all vote, and they all have authority, and it's up to them to decide the case. No, 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 no. When you see tell it to the church, you have to interpret that in the broader context of Scripture. Yeah, the church is told. But who are the acting judges of the church? Who are the elders of the church? Who are the overseers of the church? Who has been called by God and qualified by the Holy Spirit and ordained and appointed to deal with these cases? The elders. The elders. If the church is interpreted as the locally organized fellowship of believers, then the analogy of Scripture teaches us that the body of elders will be notified and will do their job as church governors or rulers. Also, when the proper time arrives, the congregation will be notified to assist with prayer. And if there are knowledgeable believers in the church who know the offending party, they will be asked to render assistance in retrieving the offender. Certainly, a lot of wisdom and knowledge can be found outside the local session. But it is one thing to tell the church and something far beyond to make every member a judge on the court. And you shouldn't do that when it contradicts the rest of the New Testament and it contradicts the meaning of what it means to be an elder and it contradicts the whole Old Testament. If you're going to interpret it that way, you better have some clear evidence. And the phrase told to the church is not clear evidence, and I think that's their best argument. In addition, we must keep in mind that the expression tell it to the church was made to the apostles long before the formal establishment of the Christian church in Acts chapter 2. The disciples would have naturally interpreted this statement in terms of the local Jewish assemblies or synagogues of that day. The disciples would have interpreted our Lord's statement in terms of what took place among the Jews in their local synagogue courts. The synagogues did not allow all covenant heads in the congregation to vote on discipline cases. They were ruled by elders. Why would the apostles think anything else when you consider the cultural melu or what was going on in the church at that time, the Jewish church? Here's what Samuel Miller says. A few ministers of the Church of England during the reign of Queen Elizabeth were more distinguished for talents, learning, and piety than Thomas Cartwright, professor of divinity at the University of Cambridge, the opponent of the high political claims of Archbishop Whitgift, and concerning whom the celebrated Beza pronounced that he thought, quote, the sun did not shine upon a more learned man. This eminent divine commenting on Matthew 18, 17, tell to the church, etc., thus remarks, Theophylact upon this place interpreted tell the church that is many because this assembly taketh knowledge of this and other things by their mouths, that is, the governors, their governors. Chrysostom also saith, tell it to the church, is to tell the governors thereof. It is therefore to be understood that these governors of the church, which were set over every several assembly in the time of the law, were of two sorts. For some had the handling of the word, some other watching over the offenses of the church did, by common counsel with the ministers of the word, take order against the same. Those governing elders are diverse today, times in the story of the gospel made mention of under the title of rulers of the synagogue. 
In this manner of government, because it was to be translated into the Church of Christ under the gospel, our Savior, by the order at that time used among the Jews, declareth what after should be done in his church. Agreeably hereunto, the apostle doth declare the Lord's ordinance in his behalf and put the same in practice, in ordaining in every several church, beside the ministry of the word, certain of the chiefest men which should assist the work of the Lord's building. This was also faithfully practiced of the churches in, after the apostles' time, as long as they remain in any good and allowable soundness of doctrine. And being fallen from the churches, especially from certain of them, the want thereof is sharply and bitterly cast in the teeth of the church's teachers, by whose ambition that came to pass. And as proof of this, the author quotes in his margin the very passage of Ambrose, cited in the previous section, and which has always given so much trouble to prelatists and independents. End of quote. So keep in mind, here's the, here's the command in Matthew 18 to the, this, the apostles. Tell to the church. Well, the Christian church, there were, there were followers of Christ, but we don't even see a Christian church really till Acts chapter 2, assemble. And then they get the gift, and then the church, that's considered the formal inauguration of the new covenant church. Well, the apostles are naturally going to interpret tell it to the church, which is ecclesia, a synonym of the synagogues, in that way. The synagogues, all the people didn't vote on matters of discipline. Only the elders, whether teaching elders or ruling elders, voted. That's it. That's the best that independents have to offer for their view. We're supposed to abandon what we find in the New Testament and what we find uh, in the best Reformed churches on that scanty evidence, which is not evidence at all. I say not. I reject congregationalism as unscriptural and destructive of the biblical view of church government. And of course, historically, it's been a complete disaster. It's been a complete disaster. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you that you've given us a, a great form of church government. We know it's been abused. We know that there are many elders who shouldn't be elders, and there's a lot of incompetence and prelacy and popery and modern Presbyterian circles. But this is the system you've given us. It's the best system. It's the most wisdom. It works the best. As long as we hold it up to the Word of God and make decisions based on the Word of God, help us, Lord, to establish it faithfully in all churches. Bring revival. Bring revival among modern Presbyterians who become bureaucratic and prelatical and arbitrary and also congregational in that they allow all sorts of exceptions to the standards. Help us, Lord, have faithful Presbyterianism in our day. In Jesus' name, amen.